Hello, my name is Roman, and I'm a software engineer on the machine learning infrastructure team here at Netflix. When you think machine learning at Netflix, you're probably thinking about how it's used to personalize your home page. And that's true. We do that a lot. We use it to determine what shows to show you, the order in which we show them to you, as well as the art that each show is, dis use, is used to display each show. But that is not the only use case of machine learning at Netflix. We have a lot of other use cases that are not user facing, but that are used to inform business decisions. We use them, for example, to try to predict user churn, the genres that people are interested in, or the value of a content to determine whether or not we should purchase it, or to figure out things like production schedules, release dates, targets for marketing campaigns, etc. So all these use cases are important and they help determine how we spend the $12 billion that we do on content. Uh, it, it's probably more now, this are numbers from 2018. So how do these use cases happen? So for example, you have an executive read who has a question about something and machine learning can help inform that decision. So read would go to a website and type in some information. For example, read wants to determine the number of users that would potentially watch a movie that is being produced. Once the information is entered, it is sent to some server in the back end that then talks to some data, then some models, et cetera, does some computation and returns a response back to read. The server may also want to log this response somewhere so that it can be used later for auditing. So all this is possible today. There's nothing extraordinary about it. And for example, in Python, you could use things like JUnicorn, Flask for your server, you could use S3 to store your models and weights and other information, and you could use Kibana to store your logs. If you don't know what any of these things are, that's okay. That's the point of this talk. But just know that it's possible to do so today. So to recap, after you've extracted your data, after you've trained your model, we went over two use cases. The first one, the personalization. For those who remember, this is the Netflix prize, which aimed to find a better personalization algorithm before machine learning and deep learning. Or the business critical use case, where we want to produce a result as well, but it is not user facing, so it has different requirements. To be complete, there are two other cases that I haven't talked about, the batch processing use case and the exotic one-off experiment. Each of these use cases have different characteristics. For the first one, the personalization case, you need a very high uptime, you have very strict SLA and very high QPS. This is because our members come to their web page or their mobile device or wherever they access Netflix from. And we want to be able to return that front page very quickly so that they have a good experience. The batch use case is background processing, usually doesn't have very strict SLA requirements and there's very little differentiating logic between different batch processing. Once you're inferring for a particular model, you can pretty much infer for other models in very similar way. For the quirky exotic experimentation, people want this to be fast. They have lots of differentiating logic. And it may be anything that they want to do for this. So this is a very kind of bucket for everything that doesn't fit in the other three. And the last case, the business critical use case, is very important to do right, but it has more flexible SLA. It doesn't necessarily matter if it's not working at three in the morning when no one's working. It has much lower QPS than the personalization use case, but they're important QPS because we actually want to provide answers to the executives that need them. So at Netflix, like at lots of other companies, two types of people are involved in helping with these uh, cases. The first ones are engineers, and the second one are data scientists. And the question is, who is best suited to help deploy these models in each of these use cases? For the first two, engineers are better suited. They're better suited at optimizing things for very strict SLA, deploying uh, vastly parallel um, architectures to be able to answer, to respond to lots of QPS. In the second case for the background processing, there's very little differentiating logic, very little thing that data scientists can bring um, that would help in that case. But for the last two cases, it's interesting to figure out who is better suited, data scientists or engineers, and their arguments for both. 
So if you think about the language that data scientists and engineers speak, they're vastly different. On the left hand side, you have the language that engineers speak. They speak about REST APIs, Flask app, Spinnaker, which is what we use to manage our containers, containers, and EC2, which is our compute substrate, for example. This is Netflix specific, but you'll have something like that for every company. And on the right hand side, data scientists just really care about the code logic and about potentially tracing their response and the request so that they can see what the model did. So these are very different terms, logic, objectives. And if both the data scientist and the engineer are collaboratively trying to deploy a service, it can get a little hairy. It's a little difficult and it's not always the most productive. As a case in point, this is taken from a talk on PyData in New York City in 2019, the emphasis is mine. But this was a talk about how different stakeholders can need to be managed in a data science project. And the part that struck me was the part about uh, system engineers, IT and DevOps, where basically when access is needed of the project and moves from modeling to deployment, only IT can get it done. So there's a bottleneck from the data scientist's perspective on IT and IT has a whole bunch of other things to work on as well. So for example, this is what an engineer deploying a service would look like. The engineer is happily doing his or her work and a model comes along and the data scientist says, hey, I need your help to deploy this. And that can be handled fairly easily. And then two models, two different data scientists come along. Okay, I still do that. And then more and more and more model. At this point, the data science, the software engineer is starting to feel that this is a little bit too much. It becomes unmanageable very, very quickly. Netflix, for example, we, in my group, we deal with hundreds of data scientists that are very productive and want to do lots of different things and try lots of different models. We couldn't possibly help each and every one of them individually deploy every single one of their models. On the flip side, a data scientist deploying a model might start out happy saying, okay, here's what I want my model deployment to do when I get a request and I write a little piece of code that will do the inference. That part's easy. And then say, like, okay, the function needs to be put in a server and it needs to have a API that a user can hit. Okay, that, that sounds doable. So the data scientist can go ahead and do that. And then this needs to be deployed on backend compute clusters, uh, which have their own needs. So someone talked to the data scientist about Docker. So the data scientist goes and tries to figure out how to Dockerize this and deploy it. And then if the data scientist wants his or her service to be available to lots of different users, Someone told them, well, you should put a load balancer and replicate your service. And that is starting to get very complicated. And then the data scientist may want to deploy this multiple times or multiple versions of the service. That is just becoming very, very difficult for the data scientist. So what's the solution to this? The software engineer obviously can't scale to provide individualized support for each data scientist and data scientists can't be expected to know how to deploy their services in the best possible way, knowing that the infrastructure underneath them may change, may evolve, et cetera, et cetera. This is where Metaflow and Metaflow hosting come in. And the code that the data scientist would have to write for their service looks a little bit like this. So it's quite simple. It just uh, is pure Python and nothing else. No dealing with the underlying infrastructure. So to recap, what do data scientists really care about? Well, when we ask, they would like things to be easy to define and deploy. They don't really care about how it's deployed or the deployment stack or what gets it to work. They just want it to be easy. They like it to be auto-deployed. So for example, when uh, they train a new model, they would like that model to go and be deployed so that users can use it. They don't really care how it's linked to the training. They just want it to happen transparently. They also care about lineage. They want to know what result was produced by what model when it was queried. They don't really care where it's stored or how we track 
how the model are linked to the training. They just want it to happen. And they care about being able to debug their application. Uh, if something goes wrong, they want to know what happened. And they also want to understand what requests produced what response. They don't really care about how we do tracing, blogging, et cetera. They just want to have that functionality for them. So to start, I will give a quick primer on Metaflow. So Metaflow is open source and it's available at the website that you hear, see here, metaflow.org. So you can go and check it out. The hosting portion of it is not yet open source, but everything else that I will be talking about is. So Metaflow allows you to define at a very high level your computation in the form of a graph where you have some input, some computation that you write as a Python function, which produces some output. And then you define your entire computation as this DAG. So we call this a flow. So the flow is the entire uh, directed acyclic graph or DAG of the program. And a run is an instance of that flow. Inside the flow, we have steps, which are here, start, A, B, join, and end. And a task is an instance of the step. So for example, uh, in this case, the step A will only have one instance. since There's only one run, but you can also have um, a for each, which is a, a data parallel a section of code, for example. The benefits of writing your code as a directed acyclic graph is that each node is a separate, separate process that can be run either on the same machine or on different machines. So there's a natural scalability aspect to it. And there's also at each of these uh, nodes, a natural checkpointing um, point where the node is self-contained and the result produced by that node can be checkpointed and, ret and retrieved later. So this allows a lot of nice things, particularly for the hosting side of things that I am discussing in this talk. So on the left here, you see a sample graph. And on the right, you see the syntax of how you would define it in Metaflow. As you can see, it is very straightforward. There's just the use of small decorators to just indicate that a function is a step. And then you link each step using the next function to tell Metaflow what is the next step that needs to be executed upon completion of that current step. So um, something that is relevant for hosting, data movement. So here I will give a kind of a walkthrough of how data is stored and processed um, in Metaflow. So as the example here, I use the same graph. And here on the right, you can see that I set a value called x to 0. So x will be 0 at the start step. And then um, at each of the other steps, I indicate how the value of x evolves. So we use something in Metaflow called uh, content hashing, where all the values are hashed and stored in our uh, storage system. And at Netflix, we use S3. And then we use we basically just have a lookup mechanism to say, OK, what was the value of x for my flow run 0 start step and the task ID, in this case, 639. It will just link the name with the hash of that value. So here, for example, uh, x is hashed as a4abb6. And this continues for all the other flows. And the advantage of this is that the values are only stored once, and they're lazily loaded. But they're also available at the end of each step. So for example, for the hosting side, at the end of your flow, if you have something that is called model, it is now stored in S3 and is accessible for your deployment. So now we get into hosting. There's two assumptions for hosting functions that we deploy with the system. One is that they have to be state free. The reason we want to do this is we want to be able to provide high scalability. The second is that they're synchronous. A single request takes a reasonable amount of time. So this system does not yet support something where you would send a request and they would call you back when the response is there. In most of our cases, this is completely sufficient. So here's the basic concept. Again, on this graph initially, um, suppose that this is the training flow and um, we have the graph on the left as usual that I've already shown. And so, the only thing you would have to do here is write your endpoint, and this, which looks very similar to what you had, what the data scientist wants to write. But the only difference is this self.artifacts.flow.x, which basically takes 
the value of x at the end of the flow. And remember, I had said previously that all this is stored into S3. So basically, under the hood, this is going to get the value from the flow, from the run that you uh, trained your model on. So this can be a model, and then you basically use that model to do inference. So from the data scientist's point of view, this is extremely easy. There's nothing else to do. Then the user can just hit a URL and the code will get called and produce the result. We also have auto deployment where inside your flow, you can basically indicate saying, hey, I would like the values that are present in this step to be deployed and present at the self.artifacts.flow that I showed earlier. So this is the only thing that you have to add inside your flow. So you, in your end step here, you can say, for example, whatever was present in join the previous step, I want this to be deployed. You can also specify some validation functions so that the user can rest assured that the flow that is being deployed is correct. We also have model lineage. You can deploy a particular run and that will have in the URL an ID like V0, for example. If you deploy it again after another run or if you auto deploy it inside another run, it will have another ID V1. And then you can promote a particular run so that the users hit that one uh, primarily using the shortened URL that doesn't have a version number. And internally, we keep track of which version is promoted at what time so that for any request, we can tell you which version was hit, um, whether it was V0, V1, or any other version that you may have deployed. So how did we do from the data scientist point of view? If you remember the initial slide of what the data scientist cares about. So do we have a simple definition here? Yeah, it's fairly simple. It's just a Python class with endpoint functions, nothing else. It's fairly straightforward. Simple deployment, yeah, kind of okay. It's a command line interface deployment. There's no UI, so no button to press. So that could be improved. Auto deployment, yes, you can deploy at the end of the training run and you can fully use Metaflow's scheduler. I did not talk about this in this talk because it is somewhat out, off topic. But if you use Metaflow, you can use Metaflow to run scheduled training runs, for example, using at Amazon step functions. And at the end of that, it could deploy your model. Lineage, yes, all deployed versions are linked to a train model and each request is tied to a deployed version, so implicitly to the train model. And debugability, all requests are logged and traced and you can reproduce them locally. The underpinning infrastructure, and this is something that is hidden from the data scientist, but we use um, an open fast derivative as the function as a service backend for our compute infrastructure. We use a backing database and a control plane to version and track the models. S3, which is Metaflow storage infrastructure, is used to store anything that we need and logging and tracing are, searched, are logged to Elasticsearch. If you'd like to learn more about Metaflow and other topics, there is a talk tomorrow as well on the Accelerate stage at 2 p.m. Central European time, which talks about Metaflow and its availability for R. This is a fairly new feature. So Metaflow is a Python tool, but we have made it also available for R if you are an R user. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us using Gitter. You can also send me an email directly. And please check out Metaflow. Thank you so much.